It is Friday, May 14th. Let's talk PlayStation. All right, everyone, welcome back. We have another very big high profile game coming out today with Mass Effect, the Legendary Edition. So like we said, all these games are finally coming out, which is great to see. I am in complete envy of anybody that has the time to pick that game up today and actually have the time to go through all of them again. But if you are doing that today, I hope you thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, let's start off as always with our PlayStation Plus reminder. The May games are still available, so make sure you grab these before they go away. Also, this is your last reminder for Horizon Zero Dawn, the Complete Edition, as part of the Plate Home Initiative. This is the last day to actually grab this game, so make sure you do that as well. And this is a good segue into our first news story, which is our final update for the Plate Home Initiative. So the next round of freebies is actually going to be a bunch of in-game content for existing titles. So unfortunately, no free games on their own, but a lot of free in-game content, and that is... A number of things really so you're getting the ps plus pack for rocket league that includes customization items brawlhalla play at home pack that'll feature a bunch of skins emotes and a sidekick you'll get 1100 destruction points for destruction all-stars 10 the show packs for mlb the show 21 a play at home pack for nba 2k 21 which includes my team series 2 amethyst damian lillard and 5000 my team points Rogue Company Play at Home Pack, that'll have the Kyoto Undercover uh, Ronin Outfit and 200 Rogue Bucks. World of Tanks and World of Warships has a bundle with a ton of XP boosters and 7 days of premium account access. And then Warframe will get the Starter Bundle with 100 Platinum, 100,000 credits, and a 7 day Affinity Booster and more. And then on May 20th until June 6th, and June 6th will be the cutoff date for all these freebies, but starting May 20th, Call of Duty Warzone, you'll get 5 double XP tokens. And that is our final roundup of the Play at Home initiative for this year. I don't think we'll see this again given it came about from the pandemic, so it was relevant in 2020 and relevant this year. Uh, but still, can't really complain with all the freebies that we got up to this point, so um, if you've got any of those games, then you've got some freebies coming your way. Now moving on to our next news story, we've actually got another Sony initiative to talk about here, which is Days of Play 2021. It's back again for this year, and in prior years we've seen the company do some pretty cool things like offer exclusive controllers, consoles, headsets. Uh, they usually run a sale, which they are doing again towards the end of the month alongside a free multiplayer weekend where you don't need PS Plus to play online. But largely what they're doing this year is a community focused event where you can sign up on PlayStation.com to be a part of this right now, but it will start from May 18th until June 7th. And it's essentially three waves where the community is trying to reach certain milestones for total games played and total trophies earned. And if those milestones are met, the community will unlock exclusive PS4 themes or PSN avatars. And that's pretty much it. So nothing crazy, but if you do want to sign up, which you have to if you want to participate, I'll leave that link down below just so it's easier to follow the link off of this video once you're done watching. So you can sign up from there and just get that taken care of right away. But yeah, not all too exciting. I mean, PS4, it's near the end of its life cycle, so you're not going to get new DS4s or consoles for that matter. And PS5, we're only just now getting new DualSense colors, which we'll talk about in a second here. So uh, probably by Days of Play 2022, the company will be more comfortable offering variations of PS5 controllers, accessories, and you would assume hardware, or really what would make more sense is the faceplates. We're all kind of assuming that's going to happen eventually, so by this time next year, that's probably what we'll see. With that said, we can segue beautifully into our next news story, which is, yes, we're finally getting two new DualSense colors, Midnight Black and Cosmic Red. These will be available next month depending on where you live and overall availability of your local retailers. It might be later in the month, but around June 11th to June 18th, it should be available from there. And they look great. I'm just a little surprised that we didn't get blue right away, but that's all right. That will probably come eventually. For now, at least, Midnight Black will probably please most people that had a problem with the white controllers and how easily they would stain, so that's a great option for most. Uh, the Cosmic Red is also pretty fascinating because, well, first off, Sony said the design characteristics of these controllers were based off of very much deep space and some of the red hues that you would find in space. So that kind of explains why this is a deeper red and not quite a bright in your face red that I think a lot of folks were also really looking forward to. So that might come eventually down the road, but for now, this is the red option that you have for the dual sense, which I think it looks really nice. And I'm not even really a huge fan of red as a color. So I'm excited to see it in person. And now it's also a matter of how long until we get another round of colors and also the eventuality that we expect Sony to offer color matching face plates or just offering different face plates in general, if that will even end up happening. 
Next up, Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart recently had a preview event at a number of outlets, and so far the results have been overwhelmingly positive for the most part, which is really great to see, but also we saw the game's director, Mike Daly, speak with IGN, and he gave a number of interesting details about the game. So a few things that we did learn, a lot of the time was spent on the weapons as expected in typical Ratchet and Clank fashion. They all have to be a potential favorite. They've got to be a 10 in some way, essentially. There'll be a good mix of mini games and exotic traversal. There's some influence in here from Spider-Man and Sunset Overdrive when it comes to traversal, so giving Ratchet and Revit more freedom of movement. PS5 is the least constrained hardware the team at Insomniac has ever worked on, referencing the more bespoke features of PS5 like the SSD, 3D audio, and the DualSense features instead of the expected visual enhancements that come with new hardware. The game will also have a very straightforward Platinum Trophy, can be done in one playthrough, which is really nice to see. Not to say that the game is short, but rather you don't have to start a whole new playthrough to achieve the Platinum Trophy, which is always nice. And you can make the game more challenging with the expected challenge mode alongside difficulty settings. And we also learned Ratchet and Clank has gone gold ahead of its June 11th release date. And that's always encouraging to see when we talk about 2021 release date games. A lot of the development pipelines have shifted for many developers. So some games have been delayed by a few months, a few quarters, or even a whole year. So the game will hit June 11th. And that's probably why Sony was very confident to do this preview event nearly a month before the game actually comes out because they're quite confident in the product that they have here and that's what's always been so great about Ratchet and Clank it's just such a fun feel good game you can't really go wrong with it it's always such a such a joy to play and go through right not only is it, it it's almost always a visual showcase for the PlayStation hardware that it's on this one is certainly no different but it's just fun the gunplay, uh, the humor, the story, which actually is very meaningful, and it's been running since uh, the PlayStation 2 now at this point, and so there's actually a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of really interesting, funny, deep lore there that you can really get invested in. It's just it's so great to see a 3D platformer like Ratchet still doing so well uh, in 2021, and I feel like there's going to be a lot of heavy momentum going into this game when it launches next month, and I I cannot wait to play it. Moving on to our next news story, and unsurprising news, we once again learned from a new trailer on Sony's PlayStation YouTube channel that Final Fantasy VII Integrate has some timed exclusivity on PS5, at least six months at a minimum, until it can go anywhere else. And I mean, now we're sitting on, what, 16, 17 months from the PlayStation 4 remake release, where that game still hasn't really gone anywhere, or there, there's been no significant movement there. So Sony's still been either extending this, or Square hasn't been doing much of anything, but we all know that Sony wants to get in bed with Square when it comes to this franchise, and really a number of projects in particular, ones that we know about, and more than likely a lot of other projects that we don't know about. Um, Sony does want to stay very close to this franchise because the association is just too strong there. So unsurprisingly for Final Fantasy VII Integrate on PS5, we're once again seeing more timed exclusivity. And also as a cautionary warning, uh, the Yuffie DLC, we also learned that as a download code, it is not printed on disc. So if you're eventually going to buy this or play it, make sure you're buying a new copy or downloading it directly from the PlayStation Store. Unfortunately, you can't, well, I mean, you could buy a used copy, but in all likelihood that code will be used. So this is something where if you don't buy on day one, you're gonna have to wait for a sale for a brand new copy and use the download code that way, which is a huge bummer. And they do this definitely to circumvent uh, a lot of that used market, but uh, that is also something that you should be aware of when it comes to potentially looking at and buying this game. Next up, the PlayStation Store on PS3 and PS Vita. As you all recall, these stores were going to shut down, but then Sony reversed their decision so you can keep buying content indefinitely, and that was great news, but we didn't find out about PlayStation Vita developers because that was the big problem at the time of the announcement was they said you can keep submitting games until July something, but then the store is only up until August, so a lot of active Vita developers were scrambling to release their games on time for probably very little gain, and so we were wondering if that was also extended as well, but we're finding out that is not the case. So despite the fact that the stores are staying open, there will be no new PlayStation Vita games after this summer. So that is pretty disappointing that it wasn't at least a little bit extended so these final games can get released. Uh, the sometimes you publisher over on Twitter did confirm this. So that is what we're dealing with here. There will be no new PS Vita games, but indefinitely you can still keep purchasing the existing content that are available on the storefronts. 
Um, it's nice to have the confirmation, but still not really uh, great news considering these are still the folks that were uh, burned the most. They were the most dedicated to this platform and yet they won't be able to get these games out on time. For our next news story, as part of the ongoing legal battle between Apple and Epic, we learned another very interesting detail that we otherwise would have never found out about, which is how Epic approached all the platform holders trying to court their first party software to release exclusively on the Epic Games storefront. And it sounds like Epic's first contact with Sony, or at least their initial offer from this document, was $200 million to release four to six first party games, and at the time of the document they were awaiting feedback. Now, based on what we know today, we know that Sony probably didn't go for this. Uh, not only does 200 million sound fairly low for four to six games, but the deal obviously could have been structured in such a way from Sony's point of view where it worked out much more favorably. They could have, you know, had a back and forth where it worked out better for them. But we know today that Sony actually does day and date PC releases on Epic Game Store and Steam, which is something that Epic would not agree to, or certainly they wouldn't want that to happen in the first place. I would imagine Sony knows their worth when it comes to their first party software, thus they didn't work out any sort of deal. But when looking at something like Microsoft, they mentioned they opened up conversations, but there was going to be some pushback here because of PC Game Pass, they're effectively bidding for content against each other, and they also mentioned Phil is meeting with Gabe at Valve occasionally, proving once again that Microsoft is approaching every single publisher, developer, anybody that's got a service in this business, they are approaching whoever to try and work something out for content or some sort of collaboration, so that's not really surprising. And then for Nintendo First Party, it just says, not started is a moonshot unto itself. Corporate history says this is a non-starter. So it almost sounds like they're not even going to try or attempt, or there's just no price tag they can put on it to try and get Nintendo First Party to move outside of the Nintendo ecosystem, which, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's not gonna happen. Moving on to our next news story, as part of a recent Wired article talking about PS5's first six months in the market, we're hearing directly from SIE President CEO Jim Ryan and PlayStation Studios head Herman Hulst about just how well the console's doing, but more so we're being given some insight into how many games are in development for PlayStation 5 right now under the PlayStation Studios moniker. And that's important to note here because technically when we talk about PlayStation Studios, it's different from when we referred to it as Worldwide Studios because that would have been strictly first party software as in not the second party external development stuff. Nowadays when Sony says PlayStation Studios that includes first and the second party stuff. But we're being told that there are over 25 games in development right now, nearly half of which are a new IP. So Herman Hull says, and I quote here, there's an incredible amount of variety originating from different regions, big, small, different genres. That quote was very short, sweet, and to the point, and you can tell the words were carefully chosen to address what we've been seeing the past few months, which is this notion that Sony Interactive Entertainment isn't taking risks, or they're not going to take risks anymore, or move away from new IP or these smaller niche genres, and that they're only going to focus on the big budget, high caliber, well-established stuff, um, which I think was way too soon of a call to even say, even when you point fingers at Jim Ryan or Herman Hulse where they're newly appointed and they haven't had the job that long, so they can't even take credit for the, the varied launch lineup of, of PlayStation 5, which is inherently what we had, right? We had a you know roguelike just come out we've got ratchet and clank coming soon we had sackboy spider-man on day one uh, a remake of a souls game on day one and that game on its own is a truly next-gen experience that's only available on playstation 5 so even if you discredit the cross-gen stuff i mean it's just weird right but even if you discredit all that software and say we can't give any credit to jim ryan or herman Hulst. Uh, the thing is, games do take three, four, or five years, right? It will take a while until we see a lot of these, you know, 25 plus games eventually come out and we see what that varied lineup actually looks like. So, yeah, they're saying it's big, small, different genres. And honestly, I think that's probably what we're going to get because that's just the company's history, right? It's been in their DNA for a long time. Um, so, you know, we can look at things like the Days Gone 2 thing falling through. We can look at things like Japan Studio, uh, you know, being restructured and the um all those ip from japan studio possibly going dormant or what have you right but we can only we can only judge so much up until we see the end results and we know that the one thing that sony's always been fairly consistent with is a lot of software constantly coming out at a good pace and they've got a solid track record and reputation for high quality software so it's just something where 
we kind of knew a lot of games were coming, uh, whether it's first or second party. And that actually goes nicely into our next news story. So we can just talk about that right now, which is Sony XDev Europe. So one thing that a lot of people seem to miss here is that for XDev Europe, this is the external development arm that Sony's had for a very long time. But traditionally it is XDev Europe, as in it always does external development for developers that are in Europe, right? So there's a lot of collaborative work and you know, tools and resources that developers can use uh, directly from XDev, and that's just how that has always played out. But uh, recently, we've seen a lot of those job titles at XDev Europe, and the branding of XDev just changed to that XDev, Sony XDev. Uh, and a lot of those titles that uh, a lot of the people that are working at Sony XDev, those are their titles now just external producer, global external producer. Um, so it seems very obvious that the Japan Studio restructure aligned with the fact that those the external development department which we know sony does for a lot of software that wasn't going to be that wasn't going anywhere japan studio for the past few years has been relegated to those external development projects and now that very much like the company said was moving on a global scale which a lot of that responsibility is now falling squarely on sony xdev which is now being rebranded to handle the full global operations of external development and that's why we also have job listings for external development producers in Japan and Asia. So that is where they're expanding their reach. So this is the same department or subsidiary, quote unquote, which would be Sony XDev, but now the the talent and the workforce is very much on a global scale to handle all that software that might be uh, happening in Japan or might be happening in Europe or might be happening in the US, right? Um, so that's what we're seeing right now play. That's what we're seeing play out. Next up, did you want more bad news about how you probably won't be able to buy a PlayStation 5 anytime soon? Well, we've got more of that directly from, once again, Sony CFO Hiroki Totoki. So this happens on a weekly basis now at this point where the company reiterates, yes, we cannot make more of these things. We cannot keep up with demand. So as part of an internal business meeting, uh, anonymous sources approached Bloomberg and apparently Hiroki Totoki said this, and I quote here, I don't think demand is calming down this year. And even if we secure a lot more devices and produce many more units of the PlayStation 5 next year, our supply wouldn't be able to catch up with demand. Now, the implication here actually is that next year would still be a very rough year in terms of actually trying to meet that demand uh, to where you can comfortably go to, go to a store whenever you want and buy a PS5, no problem. And that is the, I guess that's also a concern, right? Because when we were told there's more supply going into the second half of 2021, it's like, okay, that's cool, but that's close to the holiday season. Demand will uptick again. Thus, it will be difficult to get a hold of a console. Well, what about early 2022? But then we're getting into peak years of a console life cycle, right? When you get to year two, but really year three and four, that's where it's gonna be the peak years. And that's where a lot of people are gonna be constantly buying PlayStation 5s and Xbox Series S and X. You're gonna have a more established library. You're gonna have more people wanting to get off of their previous gen machines. And so when you get closer and closer, to 2023 it's you know so if you still can't keep up with manufacturing more of these things then it's just a, a vicious cycle I, I can't believe this is really the situation we found ourselves in we were hoping q1 of this year was going to be somewhat optimistic but of course that idea completely went out the window for our next news story consider this rumor but it looks like right now we might have some initial details on the next generation playstation vr headset uh, we've got some sources speaking with Upload VR, telling us that Sony is briefing a lot of their partners on some of the aspects of the next generation headset that has not been made public just yet. So what Upload VR has been told so far is that resolution for the headset would be 4000 by 2040 or 2000 by 240 per eye. For context, that would be more than the Quest 2, but still under the HP Reverb G2+. Plus. Uh, a lens separation adjustment dial. There would be gaze tracking capable of foveated rendering, a motor in the headset for haptic feedback, and that single cable connection would be USB-C, so you can plug that right into the front of the console. And that's all we've got right now, but this would be the vital info that you would share with key partners. And so far it's sounding really good. I mean, resolution, you want this to be as high as possible. That directly relates to the image quality that you're looking at. And for PlayStation VR and all those headsets that launched five years ago now at this point, 
Um, you can put them on and you can be impressed with the immersion aspect, but oftentimes people do that and they go, yeah, but it's a little blurry. Can you make it better? And you have to tell them, no, that's, <laughs> that's what it looks like. So the sharper, the better. And then foveated rendering. So this is a big deal because this is a development technique that developers can use and you can combine this with the gaze tracking. So if the headset knows where you're looking, you combine that with foveated rendering. This is where you can get the sharpest image quality with what you're looking at. And then in your peripheral vision, um, it can dynamically change the resolution on the fly to lower that, right? It's budgeting graphics more or less. And actually that works better for immersion too, because in real life, when you're looking straight, you're getting the clearest image in your peripheral vision. You don't see everything 100% clearly. So that is something where it, it would be a huge plus in both respects. Uh, then the haptic feedback in the headset, I believe this was a rumor a long time ago that we've already discussed. It sounds weird, right? But, and you do have to go about it in a very cautious way to make sure that the haptics aren't too aggressive because it's your head, it's a very sensitive area. But if you can do it correctly and make it feel as though you're really there, right? I mean, I know we throw this around a lot, presence and immersion, but if you can, if you can trick the body to think that you're really in that virtual environment, that helps mitigate motion sickness. So like the worst offender here is a, a racing game where you are, if you're seeing a lot of fast movement, but your body is stationary, right? I mean, if you can do something where it makes it really feel as though your body is traveling at such a speed, then uh, it just, it goes a long way with mitigating that motion sickness if it affects you greatly. So like that's a, that's a genre where it's, it's really tough on me. So haptics can go a long way in mitigating that. Now, based on everything confirmed and unconfirmed up to this point, this headset is sounding like a very a very substantial leap over the PSVR that we know today. And even if you mess with current headsets right now, this uh, this one that we're hearing about, I mean, it's, it's very competitive with everything that's available right now. I mean, it sounds really good. And if you are in a space right now where you're kind of annoyed or disappointed with the diminishing returns we're seeing in the 2D space of console and PC, um, then VR is seeing a lot of really exciting advancements on a much greater magnitude than what we are seeing in the 2D space, right? That's what's always been so encouraging about VR is that you can see a lot of advancements much quicker than, um, than what we're used to. And if you didn't like the current PSVR headset, or if you've tried uh, an older VR headset, then you might want to start looking at this one. Now, with all that said, it is time to get to Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter. If you would like to win a $10 PSN code, it's very easy. Follow the link down below. Supporting this channel a number of ways can gain you an entry. And I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to pay for your games. Those are all the news stories that I want to talk about to you all from this past week. Uh, we had no Tuesday video because what I was working on took too long and just kind of turning into a pain. So that will more than likely be this Tuesday's video. Uh, maybe an additional one as well because the other video will be easier to turn out. I don't know. I'll have to see how that plays out. But um, that's what happened this past week. So apologies on that. But uh, that's it. That concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Benecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me. And I will see you all next Friday.